Paulos Metzger, the director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins, and welcome to another episode of New Wine Tastings, where we are seeking to build relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. And the focus of this particular interview and a series that it's a part of is on faith and science, bridging the gap that for some people exists between faith and science. For my colleague, Dr. Robert Potter, who is joining me, uh, he has a very nuanced view of how faith and science interact, and he builds bridges between these domains. And we'll be talking about that from the vantage point of personalist ethics. Uh, it's part of a series, as I said, and the series is on a personalist approach to medical ethics. And this is the sixth episode, and it's on the theme of more than matter. Before we get into it, though, uh, I hope the viewers take note of uh, the various bow ties Dr. Potter uh, has at hand uh, for his work. It's part of his medical kit. Dr. Potter, uh, again, I've said this before, I really like your bow ties. I wish bow ties looked as good as on me as they do on you, but you want to you want to make mention of any of the, uh, your, your collection? I know you say you, you have to put them on, they don't pin on. Well, let me tell you what, why I wear a bow tie. Of course, th there has been a little bit of a history that those uh, docs who do internal medicine, which is my specialty, uh, that bow tie was sort of uh, the, the, the mark of that. But on a more practical basis, I was training at an inner city hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, there nobody wore ties of any sort. So I said, I'm going to change that. So I, we, I got everybody to put on a tie. A long tie. Okay. The problem is with a long tie, it gets into your work. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it drags down there, it gets into your work. So there was a guy who who is just starting his his internship there, who knew how to tie bow ties. I said, "Teach me to tie a bow tie." <laughs> and so I started wearing bow ties. Now I can't tell you that everybody else on the staff began to wear bow ties, but a lot of guys did. And I just continued to wear bow ties throughout most of my uh, medical career. And, uh, uh, and I just have quite a few bow ties to wear. And it became sort of a distinguishing feature of Potter's the guy who with the bow tie. It, it's a trademark. It is definitely it's a, trademark. a trademark. And yeah. um, that story is really good. I think the story that you shared on how you knew you were acclimated or ready to go for your medical career was when you were doing a lab experiment with the cadaver uh, while eating lunch. Do you want to share that, that story? Uh, yeah, well, the, here's, here is the thing. Uh, 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 we were, there were five of us at a, at a table, uh, but everybody had gone to lunch except me. They'd left the room. And I was sitting there digging around in our cadaver's right thigh, looking for a nerve or a vein or an artery or something. And I looked down and I had a ham sandwich in my left hand. I said to myself, Potter, I think you can do this medicine thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Oh that my goodness, good. yeah. Uh, so for fun people, it's kind of gross, but for me, it was sort of the turning point in my career. That's right, you you had reached that, that uh, line of demarcation and uh, right. there was no going back. So, well, with that said, both on bow ties and cadavers with ham sandwiches, let's get into it uh, for this theme of more than matter, a personal approach, personalist approach to medical ethics. Let me get into this by way of this statement. People matter and people are more than matter. Mm -hmm. This is, as I said, the sixth episode on a personalist approach to medical ethics. And uh, Dr. Potter has specialization in a very long and distinguished career by way of internal medicine, as he had said, and also palliative care. And uh, he's a medical ethicist by background as well. And uh, Robert, I was speaking with my sister about one of the discussions or a variety of discussions we've had related to Christopher. Uh, processing matters is my son, for many of the viewers who've been watching these episodes will know, my son Christopher had a traumatic brain injury in January. He's in a comatose state, three plus months. And uh, Dr. Potter has been providing my family with uh, con consultation in a holistic way related to medicine and medical ethics. And when I was talking to my sister, Nancy, about it, she remarked how Christian uh, Dr. Potter's responses were, and they weren't 
even explicitly, and they were implicitly Christian, but they, the statements themselves didn't have Bible verses attached to them, but she said that was such a Christian response uh, in how Dr. Potter was framing it. Um, however, the ethos, as I said, while it wasn't explicitly stated, the ethos and spirit that shaped uh, Dr. Potter's reflections were diff definitely Christian. Uh, one way of putting this is that, Robert, you see the cup is half full, not half empty. And while there are many personalist approaches, Christian and otherwise, yours is distinctively Christian in orientation. So could you please remark how your particular commitments as a Christian shape your overarching approach to medical ethics? And I'm going to share a few examples afterward of where I've seen this at play, where it's definitively a Christian ethos. Uh, not exclusively so, because others may resonate, but it's definitely Christian in orientation. So Robert, Dr. Potter, please. Yeah, well, my, my background is definitely Christian. My, my worldview is definitely Christian. The tradition that I grew up in, that I remain in, is, is Christian. However, I'm practicing in a medical profession that sees itself as a uh, moral enterprise, but not really as a spiritual enterprise. Mm -hmm. So the language I have to use in the medical situation needs to resonate with the, the, the faith base that I'm coming from, but at the same time, not have enough uh, specific religious or Christian character to it that, it that it causes others to stumble trying to figure out what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have created the strategy for myself of translating my understanding of ethics from that theological ethics training that I've had into a humanist ethics paradigm. Mm -hmm. And if I keep it that way, then I, the, 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 the values that are behind it are, remain intact, but the language in which it's carried forward is a language that others immediately can understand without uh, having to stumble over whether or not it's Christian or too Christian or not Christian enough or whatever. So keeping that the Christian language in the background has been an intentional strategy mm -hmm. that I worked out in my own uh, my own professional ethics function, mm -hmm. and so I, I, to me it has been it has been uh, I think successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's been successful. Um, always, I've never doubted or or I mean never denied that I was a Christian, and if asked, I would uh, offer more of a Christian angle to what I would say. But in, in approaching um, the six or eight people, say, in an ethics consultation, you know, I don't, need, I don't need to go around the room and say, which one of you is a Christian and what kind of a Christian are you, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I'm going to keep that at a, a more common language level that I'm hoping that everybody in the room can both understand and accept. And, I, and that, to me, has been a responsible and working strategy. Mm -hmm. What I've always kept in the background, when you said that glass half full rather than half empty, I approach every ethics issue with a sense of the possibilities that exist here, not with a sense that there's nothing to be done, but always that there are possibilities. Uh, to me, possibility is another word for promise. And when I think of the promises of God, uh, the uh, the possibilities of God. I, I go back to that to a to a to a 13th century um, uh, bishop who said that God is posse ipsum, Latin for possibility itself. You know, and, and I, I I just carry that forward in the ethics consultation, in in the ethics conversation, in the teaching of ethics. That you keep the possibilities wide open. It, and and you you work to uh, both uh, ex expand them and use them where you can and wait uh, wait until the possibilities are exhausted before you stop. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my that's my strategy, if you will, that I've mm -hmm. figured out. And and my sister, whose daughter is a nurse uh, out in the Boston area, 
uh, and who's had to deal with medical issues for, for many, many years, just in terms of uh, her second of three daughters having leukemia mm. and died after the third round of it with a heroic oh. battle with leukemia. Oh, my but my. Nancy has had to, and Peter and Emily and Hannah and Megan have had to work through all that for, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. but, but she picked up on what I'm going to call the Christian humanist perspective. I mean, John Calvin was a, a humanist. Now, I know how you're framing it here in terms of our contemporary context, but even my friend Tom Crademaker, um, yeah, you, yeah. May have read, you may have read some of his articles oh, yeah, yeah. in USA Debates. You recommended that book. I've read it and enjoyed it. Yes. Yes. And so, Tom, uh, I was just on the phone with Tom yesterday, and, uh, you know, Tom is over at uh, Yale Divinity School as their uh, communications director, and you know, as a, as a humanist, he has a fascinating view, and I won't go into this at great length, but uh, he is arguing for a secular form of transcendence or horizontal transcendence because he sees the need to expand the humanist framework uh, with possibilities. And, and he resonates with the idea of hope or possibilities and not looking at that cup half empty. So whether it's Christian humanism or humanism or Buddhism or what have you, there are different forms of humanism and there are different approaches to personalist ethics. You are coming at it from a Christian vantage point. And just to, to draw attention for the viewers, I, I had said I would use, um, I would share one or uh, two stories. You know, there have been times because I think, you know, doctors and nurses, they don't want to mislead people. And I appreciate that. They don't want to mislead people. They don't want people to get their hopes up too high. They want to cushion that. So I'm just trying to put it in judicious terms, even though I will admit at times when I've looked into their faces, um, I'm seeing somewhat empty stares. Uh, and as I'm processing matters related to my son's care, and it's required to use Tillich's language, courage to be, even in conversations with them, because I have to kind of expand the room with hope. And, uh, you know, I remember talking to with one healthcare. Great, great, healthcare. great phrase, expand the room with hope. It's a great phrase. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and I was talking to one nurse who meant well. Again, these are all well intentioned people but she certainly wasn't coming at it from this expanded room, expanded universe, expanded room with hope. And she said, well, it's the primitive functions of my son's brain that are operating. And you said, you know, whatever functions, you know, he could have consciousness, but if he's not breathing on his own, what good is consciousness going to do him down the road if he's not breathing on his own? So you got to start somewhere and might as well start from the bottom up. Yeah. And that example in and of itself reframed everything it wasn't that you were denying what needs to be done it's all a matter of how you frame the film uh so to speak and frame the universe and so that's one example and uh you know i could use others but maybe they'll come up uh in the course of our conversation there have been numerous examples where that's come into play um so now as i said earlier for you and me as, as Christian uh, adherents, adherents, followers of Jesus, matter is important. We take seriously, and we'll come to this later, the word becoming flesh. It's one of my favorite verses in the scriptures, and I'm sure you love it as a medical doctor, and that is John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling in our midst. And we'll talk about Gnosticism later, and a Gnostic universe tends to downplay or minimize and even demean materiality, but not so with Christianity. The Christian faith historically is all about matter matters. Irenaeus of Lyons, matter matters in his arguments with the Gnostics against heresies in his multi-volume set. So we deny Gnostic forms of spirituality, you and I. Jesus became matter, he became flesh. Biology, therefore, is really important. It's, it's, it's a crying shame to me with historiography that people have seen in the modern or postmodern period that Christian faith is somehow hostile uh, in its roots to science. I mean, that could be, that, that no further from the truth. 
And uh, so historically false. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The the Draper North thesis is is a deeply flawed thesis, and but we must guard against uh, therefore biological reductionism. And I'm going to ask you to speak to that issue in a minute, as I believe is on display in scientists like Richard Dawkins and E. O. Wilson. And I I actually appreciate reading E. O. Wilson's works uh, because he's a very humane thinker. However. He's still a biological reductionist in his socio-biological domain uh, because for them, Dawkins and Wilson, really, as I see it, biology and sociobiology is all there really is um, in their estimation. For you, on the other hand, we must account for what I call emergence, and I believe you call it that way. Christian Smith will talk about that in the book, What is a Person that we've discussed. Could you please speak to the matter of quote-unquote emergence? including how the person is not reduced to biological categories, but is built upon for you a biological basis? You know, I, uh, the, the term emergence uh, came to my attention late in my college career when I was, I was, I was kind of a little bit of a nerd and I was reading uh, Gifford lectures, <laughs> the, the famous Gifford lectures in, in, during my college career. And I read one by a uh, C.L. Morgan, uh, and it was all about emergence. And I thought, man, this is a very interesting concept about how things come together uh, out of the great complexity that is going on. Th then in the, in the late 50s, I was reading um, Pierre uh, Deschardins, and he, he came up with this word complexification which is a equivalent to um, uh, emergence. Things got more and more complicated and, they, and out of that complexification came these great creative inventions of the human being. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I love the, the term emergence. The problem that I see with what you're calling biological reductionism is they don't reduce far enough. Mm -hmm. For me, the universe is basically spiritual. Or I use the word spirit to be equivalent to the word energy. Hmm. Spirit is the field of energy that is all that is. Energy is a mystery that you cannot even come close to understanding. The nuclear physicist said, I've just busted down matter into energy and I don't know what to do with it. Hmm. it. It's the energetic relationships that come together in certain patterns that create units of matter. And then those units of matter become more and more complexified. You put a few things together. For instance, if you put a little bit of, 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 of water and a little bit of carbon, and a few minerals like a little iron, a little copper, a little magnesium, a little potassium, a little phosphorus, a little sulfur, what do you get? You and me. If you put it together just right, that's, that's all we're made of in terms of the energetic relational units uh, that, that we call matter. But out of all of that emerges the incredible capacity we have and I say to myself, okay, what has emerged in the human? As Teilhard de Chardin says, spirit is at the base and spirit is at the end. Spirit is at the emergent top. Spirit for me, as I tried to define it in my PhD work, I was saying that, that spirit, the spiritual dimension of the human is that unique emergent psychological function for making meaning. Mm. And now what I want to say about that is this. The human capacity of spiritual capacity is the capacity to experience awe. Awe. When mystery strikes us, it is awesome. Mm. And yet even awful. Mm -hmm can be both. That all needs some definition. And the spiritual dimension 
is there making meaning that we can attach to that incredible experience of awe. Oh, awe. It, it's, it's almost like what the Israelites called their God, Yahweh. Hmm. Um, and uh, it, it's the experience of the awe. That's to me the, what has emerged in the human being, the capacity to experience the mystery and to give it some content so that we have some way to re talk about it, to refer to it, to be guided by it, to be directed by it, to be motivated by it. And um, to me, um, the reductionism of Wilson and others is just not far enough. It's they haven't reduced all the matter that is down to the spirit and you build from <laughs> spirit back up to spirit. <laughs> okay, now that may be just a little bit uh, too preachy uh, for the moment, but you know, it's, it's also based on, on nuclear physics. I, you know, I remember the day, Paul, maybe I've told you this before, but I remember the day that I came out of a physics class. I was a junior in college. And I was walking up the back steps of the uh, student union. There was, a, there was a, uh, uh, a fire escape on the back end. And I got on the 13th step out of 18. And when I stepped there, I said, that's it. Spirit and energy are synonyms. That's the basis of the universe, God, the spirit. I mean, it was a revelatory moment for me. And I, I continue to build on that, Paul. But, you know, to be more on the, on the come down out of the clouds and be more practical, it is the spiritual capacity of human beings to um, sense the presence of God, mm -hmm. respond to the presence of God, uh, to be in the presence of God. And um, that's where I, ha I have carried my personalism as far as I can. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point that I really get caught. You know, because I've, I've, I've almost abandoned the notion of God as person. I'm more intrigued by God as process. And my problem, of course, is having done that is how do you have a personal relationship with process? That's my problem, not anybody else's problem. Forgive me for bringing that theological no, stuff it's, here it's, at the no, wrong time. But you know, the, the point is this. Um, we humans have reached a, 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 a level of, as they started calling, of complexification as persons. That, that, that if we, it is now possible for us to behave as persons and to make a personal relationship with all that is, whatever we're going to call it. But it's it to me, it's it's that capacity. The person is it reached finally the capacity to respond to the awe in the mystery. Hmm. That's enough yeah. for the moment. I got more to say, but let, let, let me let me let me calm down here a little bit. Get a drink of water and. Hey, get, get some new direction in your questions, man. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it, Robert. And, uh, you know, I think for the viewers and listeners, uh, they'll take note whether they agree completely, partially, or not at all with, with your particular approach to Christian personalism or mine or someone else's. Uh, you certainly, if I can use the word infuse or frame, once again, that word frame, the, the narrative of medicine and medical ethics from this vantage point. And, you know, for the viewers uh, and listeners, Dr. Potter not only has his doctorate in medicine, but he has a doctorate in theology that he did at University of Chicago Divinity School. And so he's well-versed. You know, a lot of times you'll find brilliant scientists who don't grasp philosophy of science or theology, whereas early scientists were often well-versed <laughs> in theology and some of them arose from within that context and Newton, Absolutely. Absolutely. Newton, I think if I'm not mistaken, Kepler, Galileo, um, you know, and he had his challenges with the church, but it wasn't based on uh, science and faith. It was different doc diagrams or frameworks of science. Like, is it going to be Ptolemy, Aristotle, or what Galileo was coming with? It's far more complex as the book Galileo on Trial comes into play with. Or, or Paul, but, bring it up to date. Bring it up to date. Last yeah. night on, on, on the national television, 
Francis Collins. Yeah, Francis Collins. There you go. You know, I mean, there, there's yeah. a man of science who's a man of faith. Yeah, and, and evangelical faith too. I mean, it's yeah, it's, exactly. it's breaking, and you I know, respect it. Yeah, and so you have this, uh, you know, Polkinghorne, right? I mean, another yeah. one oh, we could boy. talk of recently, and uh, well versed in both domains, as as are you, and people are bringing their perspectives to bear, whether they're conscious of it or not. It's not as if they don't have one; they have one, and it does shape their orientation. And I love what you said about you know, Dawkins and Wilson are not reductionist enough. And there's yeah. a sense, there's a sense in which you could say, I'm, I'm riffing off of Schleiermacher here, he talked about a pietism of a higher order. There's a yeah. sense in which you also want a pietism of a higher order and a lower order, Robert. Yeah, yeah, right. and, and, uh, and, and also, I would say you were, I think, almost quoting Rudolf Otto earlier with oh, yeah. um, I, the, was, I was you know, intentionally, yeah, uh, with the holy, the awesomeness and the awfulness and uh, exactly. that tremendum. And I think that that impacts how you approach the person because the spirit breathes life into the human. Mm -hmm. Genesis 2. And, like, and so when you're standing before a human, I think, Robert, this would be true of you. You're like Kant. It's the moral law within and it's the starry sky above. You might not be into Kantian ethics so much, but you really, I think, resonate with his, what I'm gonna call his romanticist impulse at that point. Um, I think you would, you would like Kant, even if he didn't wear bow ties. So um, moving into the next area of discussion, what difference do the two approaches? Biological reductionism, and I've already kind of gotten into this with my last statement, biological reductionism, in the way that it's not going deeper, deep enough or reducing enough to the energy level uh, where it, it stays short of that, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, biological reductionism and personalism. So what difference do the two approaches, biological reductionism of Wilson and Dawkins, and on the other hand, personalism involving spiritual expansion from a biological basis, make for how doctors engage medical ethics? Can you please provide a few examples? Yeah, okay, let, let me give you a little lecturette first. Um, you know, I entered medicine, uh, medical school 60 to 64. And from then on into the- That was the year I was born, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on into the uh, late 70s, we were struggling in the philosophy of medicine with what we called the biomedical model. And medicine was trying to approach the human being as a biological unit. And that was a kind of a reductionism for sure. I rebelled against that from the very moment of medical school. And, 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 I, and the, one of the places where I found that the, the way to do that was I, I found Paul Tournier, French uh, uh, Christian uh, physician, he wrote a book first, it was called The, the Whole Person in a Broken World, and then he wrote uh, The Meaning of Persons, and this one, The Healing of Persons. You know, and I read all of Tournier, and so I, I got this personalism uh, thrust kind of, kind of going early. Then I also recognized that there was an effort that gradually grew in, uh, in proportion, to move from a biomedical model to a biopsychosocial model mm. of the person. Mm. And in fact, the word person was actually used. Mm. Uh, a, 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 a academic psychiatrist by the name of George Engel, operating out of the um, uh, New York uh, Medical School, one of, the, one of the schools in New York, I don't remember where. He, he wrote extensively and did a pretty good job. However, when on close examination of his work, he never once, never once used any reference to spirit or religion or anything that you could even faintly develop as faith. Mm -hmm. And in talking to those who are trained with him, they uh, confirmed that that was something that he religiously avoided, so to speak. <laughs> and um, so I was not satisfied, even though it did expand an understanding of the person. So, you know, when I was going into my uh, 
a practice. I started practice really coming out of the military service in from Vietnam in 1970. I began my service in the medical world in 1970. And as I was growing into it, I was searching for a way to talk about the person. Uh, and because I felt like we needed a comprehensive understanding of a person to do medicine well. It uh, was hard to come by. There were a few scattered pieces here and there that I could examine. Um, but um, I had been um, encouraged to, to be an adjunct teacher at the um, Central Baptist Seminary in Kansas City, Kansas, where I lived, an American Baptist school. And uh, I was ad adjunctly teaching there and was thought of fairly favorably and encouraged to go on for further studies. So in 1985, I left practice and uh, spent two years at the University of Chicago Divinity School. It was in 1985 that Wolfhart Pannenberg, the great German theologian, his book called The, the uh, Anthropology from a Theological Perspective was translated into English. And it immediately came to my attention. It is a personalist document, which gave me the answer to what it is that the philosophy of medicine needs to do, and that is to find the way to put the spiritual dimension into the person. I began to do a little research. I examined 1,300 articles hmm. in prominent medical journals. Only 17 of the 1,300 mentioned anything that could be remotely related to spirit or religion. But they were all aimed at the person. I said, this is a flaw in medicine. So my dissertation was really a, um, an account of a sort of a, a competition between George Ingalls' biopsychosocial model of the person and Wolfhart Pannenberg's anthropology from a theological perspective, mm -hmm. emphasizing the person, okay? Mm -hmm. And those two together, as they, as they competed, I, 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 I came to the conclusion and defended the point of view that Pannenberg's expansion of the person into the spiritual is the right direction for the philosophy of medicine. Mm. Now, let me give you a practical example of that. Mm. I remember his name was John. His age was about 45. Came to me with um, a really a rapid, aggressive form of a leukemia. Leukemia as adults is a uh, Pretty bad stuff. And this was 45 years ago when, when our, our treatment modes were not all that good, actually. Sent him off to um, MD Anderson in, in Texas, and he came back, you know, nothing really to do. He was in the hospital for some kind of a complication, an infection of some sort. And I was avoiding telling him the probabilities were very low. And I remember his, his wife, his name was Mary. She caught me in the hall before I walked into his room one day and said, Potter, you're a chicken. You're not doing right for my husband. You got to go in there and tell him that he's a dying man. Well, yes, ma'am, I guess, I guess I'll have to do that. I went in there and I, as gracefully as I could, I told him he was a dying man. He accepted that in the usual way, you know, head bowed and sorry and he was kind of thing. He left the hospital that next day, didn't hear from him for six weeks. And the both the husband and wife came into the office he wasn't looking too good because he, he, was, he was wearing down, but they were smiling. 
He said, Dr. Potter, your being honest with me as a person has made the last six weeks of our life some of the greatest adventure together that we've ever had. Hmm. To be in love, to share our love, and to travel, and to experience, and on and on and on they went, as if they'd learned to live by my telling him he's going to die. Hmm. Because I, she, Mary said, treat him as a person. Hmm. A person who needs to know what's going to happen here. That story resonates so deeply with me. I still weep at it. Because, you know, it taught me that to, to deal with people as persons, you've got to be honest with them. You've got to be direct. You've got to tell them what you know. You can't hold back. You can't hide stuff. And you've got to, you got to go in there with, with, with both hands full. One hand holds the technological capacity, the, the wizardry of medicine. The other hand is the compassionate guide. The one full of empathy. And... Uh, Bringing both hands to the situation is what I learned to do that day. And that's, that's the kind of, of experience of doing ethics, particularly ethics in the palliative care situation. As you point out, that's one of my areas of specialty. You've got to deal with persons as persons. You've got to be a person to that person. And it's, it's, uh, it has been such a great um, satisfaction of my life that I learned that relatively early enough in my practice that I was able to avoid a lot of the traps that docs get into when they really approach things from the biomedical model rather from the personalist model of dealing with patients. That's a powerful story you shared about uh, the conversation with the husband and wife and. Yeah they're learning to live. And I think it was with that sense of urgency. So often we just exist rather than live. And they they lived with a sense of fullness those last weeks and months. And, and you know, you had mentioned the left hand and the right hand, whichever hand it is for, for either. We talked about this a few weeks ago with objectivity and empathy. And uh, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me bringing in Kant again, where yeah. he says concepts without percepts are empty, percepts without concepts are blind. I think there's a sense in which Empathy without the technical wizardry of science is empty, but the technological wizardry of science without empathy is blind. If, yeah. if I could, and I think you have to have the technological mastery, but what are you gearing it toward? Not just biological data or datum mm -hmm. uh, or you know uh, pieces, but one has to bring it all together and that's what the person is and how do we bring it to bear in caring for people so again one's philosophy of life does make a difference mm -hmm. and i think this is important it is important for us in terms of ethics so thank you for that powerful story and your articulation of these various themes so i believe your emphasis on this series in this series on empathy every person is an exception to the rule Mm -hmm. statistics, statistics is dealing with generalities and probabilities rather than individual cases and particular possibilities all relate to your particular form of Christian personalism. While I could share how I see you connecting the dots, how do you see all these dots connecting with people being more than matter? So I'm asking you to tie it all together, so to speak. When I read the sociological literature, and of course, you can understand that, that my science capacity is more in the social science, even though I've been trained, you know, in the biological sciences to, to be a physician. Uh, that's that that I, there, I've got an, enough expertise to sort of get by there. My my real science is social science, and of course, a lot of people would argue, well, that's not really science at all. 
but I, I beg to differ about that. I think it's real science. And what sociology tells us is that each of us, each person of us is created by our relationship to a network of relationships. And when I say I'm gonna connect the dots, I look at any one person and look for the dots that, where they are connected to others, whether that's um, a member of the Elks Club over here, or, or, or they work down here at the pipeline, or, or, they, or they vote Republican, or they, th their, their grandmother is still living over here at 102. Or, you know, all, all the, you know, to know where the relationships exist that have created this person. That's what I'm searching for. When I, when I, the more I know of that, the more dots that I connect, the more I know the person, the better I can care for them. Now, sometimes in caring for them, I cannot fix their biological problem, but I can continue to nurture them, respect them, um, help them grow as a person, enduring, persisting, working through the problems in which they exist. Um, for me, ethics is in medicine too often reduced to the notion that we should do no harm. And that, then that gets reduced, if you will, down to no harm to the body. I think it's that, that it ought to be expanded, no harm to the person. And harm to the person is not respecting their rights, not respecting their values, not respecting their dignity as a person. Now, ordinarily you think, well, you know, doctors ought to know people's names and not refer to them as the gallbladder down the hall and that sort of thing, right? Oh, we do that, uh, and sometimes we're a little crass about that. It's sort of shorthand talk about what's going on. But, but on the other hand, sometimes there are some, some physicians have failed to grow into the notion that these are real persons that they're dealing with. Uh, and, uh, and my efforts in, in ethics education, whether that was with um, nurses or with physicians in training, or physicians who uh, are well ahead uh, in their training and are now going, coming back, say, for palliative care uh, uh, education, which I taught repeatedly over and over again. You know, the notion that we, that we relate to persons as the basic um, strategy of what to complete medicine is what I was trying to teach. And I, I think that's, I think that's important enough to say that the dots I connect are the dots that make up the network of relationships of any one person's life. The more dots I know, the more dot points I know, the better I know the person. That's why I used to like to make house calls. Mm. You walk into somebody's house and in five minutes, you know more about them than you could learning and sitting down for a half an hour talking to somebody in the office. You know, more dots show up. What's that book on the table they're reading? What's that picture on the mantel? What's that wallpaper look like? When did they last put that wallpaper on? Of course, I'm thinking wallpaper, that's kind of old fashioned, but I, you know, it, it uh, when, when you ask me to connect the dots, you may not have had that in mind, but that's my answer. What I, what I connect is the dots that make up the life of the person. Mm -hmm. And the more I do that, the more I understand the person because persons are, are made up of their relationships. Enough said. Well, and I think with what you've just articulated, Robert, it takes us back to the second of our episodes, the one where we dealt with the three cardinal questions for your particular approach to personalist ethics, where you brought up H. Richard Niebuhr oh. and uh, the responsible self and his two questions, you know, mm -hmm. what is going on here? And then what is the fitting response? And you, inter uh, you 
brought in an intermediate question, right. and that is, what ought I to care about? And so, you know, all of those questions, starting with what's going on here, all those dots you're connecting, the coffee table, the book on the coffee table, all those things, you're having to account for what's going on here, the family, the various people in decision making, the patient. That's all part of a personalist ethics. It's not just the gallbladder down in room 307. Yeah. It's yeah. The, that person with the gallbladder and uh, their network of people with gallbladders. And how do we account for all of that? That's all part of your working through the ethical issues. What is going on here? All those dots to connect. What ought I to care about? Okay, how much should I care about the book on the coffee table? How much should I care about cousin Ed and Aunt Gertrude and and uh, you know nephew Jimmy? You know, it's it's but and what then is the fitting response? I think this all comes together. And I'm just for the sake of the viewers trying to connect these various dots that we've been getting at over the past several weeks. I want to just share, Robert, before I come to the closing question, one mm -hmm. one very um, important example as it relates to our situation without going into too many great details because it is sacred ground for us um, always will be but in Christopher's situation we don't ultimately know yet what will occur we're waiting to see how he'll respond and of course the injury was devastating um, as you know looking at the MRIs and I, I should say for the viewers even though Dr. Potter says uh, he's really into the social sciences. He certainly knows very well indeed all the medical aspects. I think it's his passion as time has gone on, has gone more in the realm of sociology and uh, sociology of religion and social psychology and the like, but he certainly stays up to date on all the medical um, journals and the like in the research. So it's his passion points is expanding, so to speak, that emergence theme. So I remember when we were talking about this, looking at MRIs and such, and not knowing ultimately where things will be and hoping for healing of functioning parts of the brain, you brought forth your Christian perspective of a new creation in Christ. We don't ultimately know what Christopher will, um, how he will come forth through this. We pray and hope that he does come forth. and and it may very well be that there will be different dimensions to his personhood, same person, but different dimensions to his person. And you said, he would be a new creation, a new creation in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And again, it's expanding and filling the room with hope and filling an MRI with hope. It's not a matter of taking away from the realism, we're dealing with the reality. Yeah. But it's all the matter of how we deal with it. I remember a medical doctor saying to us, well-meaning, it made no sense to me, but he said, well, I believe in mystery. I believe in medical miracles, rather. I just don't believe this is one of them. I'm thinking, well, <laughs> medical miracles are miracles. So, I mean, I, you know, I think who would ever think that it's going to be a miracle until after the fact? So the point is a new creation in Christ and that theme of personal, you were connecting the dots for us in analyzing the MRI in a very beautiful, holistic way that didn't account or discount rather the realism of the situation, but it was operating from an expansive universe, an open universe, not a closed universe. And so that said, in closing, I wish to return to the emphasis on matter and spirituality. The Christian faith affirms the material world. Again, as I said above, we deny or reject Gnosticism, the idea that spirit is over matter, that, um, that matter doesn't really count, it can be discounted uh, in various ways. Christian personalism accounts for embodied spirituality. The word became flesh, John 1, 14, and made his dwelling in our midst, as we had articulated earlier. John of Damascus, I love his statement, where he claims, we do not worship matter, but we worship the God who became matter. So we take to heart the need to engage people's embodied souls. Please close out this session sharing how medicine in your estimation is a very spiritual discipline in its regard for dealing with individual patients as what I would at least call embodied 
persons. And with that, as you share, we'll close off after your closing reflection. As I said earlier, I did this little research that was really read some articles between 1980 and 1990 and found very few in the medical literature that referred to anything like spirituality. Um, since that time, a great deal has been carried forward. The work by uh, a, a woman of the name of Christina Pokulski and Betty Farrell, these are folks on the East Coast. I knew both of these. I'd worked more with Betty Farrell in the past, but I knew both of them. In 2010, just now 10, 11 years ago, they published a book entitled um, Integrating Spirituality into Patient Care, Making Healthcare Whole. And they came up with a definition of spirituality, which is, I'll admit, humanistic in its language, but I think can be um, can be can be just gratefully given as a a definition of how spirituality is beginning to infuse medical practice. I think it's there. Here's the definition. Spirituality is the aspect of humanity, you could say of persons, that refers to the way individual persons seek and express meaning and purpose, and the way they experience their connectedness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature, and to the significant sacred. You just have to put in a few adjectives and you've got a clear Christian statement. Both these women are Christian women, but they were doing what I was doing. And that is finding a way to articulate the basis for a, a, a Christian spirituality in humanistic terms so that you could enter into the public discussion. Mm -hmm. without having to stumble over the, over the language that others might not accept. I think, I think that, that many of us in the Christian world who operate in uh, the medical world and, and elsewhere in the public sp sphere uh, ought to use this technique of making our spirituality Christian based, mine is based on Jesus. Jesus is my man, okay? Or some would rather I'd say Jesus is my Lord and I'm willing to do that too. But the language that we use needs to be able to fit into the public discussion. And I, I, that's what I salute you with your whole business of the theology of culture and the new wine and new wineskins, where you're finding ways to, to both introduce Christian thought and to carefully introduce ideas without the Christian language or, or where the Christian language uh, is, is likely to be a stumbling block, you know, leave it behind. You, you're, you're, for me, you and your work are trying to fulfill that same strategy that I've been working out as I've tried to do ethics in healthcare, mm -hmm. as to do theological ethics spiritual ethics Absolutely. in healthcare. And that's, uh, that's going to be my final statement on that one for today. And what, what, and thank you so much, Robert. And thank you for the kind and gracious words too, about the work of New Wine and my theology of cultural enterprise, which is to me about emergence. And uh, <laughs> with, with what you're saying here, I, for, for viewers and listeners, um, Dr. Potter is talking about being very personalist in orientation in the public domain, not to be parochial, in it where we have to play privatized language games and people have to try and figure out what in the world we're saying and is it you know for lack of a better word ghettoized or you know marginalized in terms of how we articulate things to go public just as our lord was in the public domain in solomon's colonnade in caesar's domain with in pilate's court truth in pilate's presence and uh, so it intersects at every turn. And I, that's one of the reasons why I find you such a fascinating uh, thinker and scholar and uh, just agreed, uh, greatly appreciated your work with New Wine over the years, Dr. Potter. Uh, 
going back to the work with the Science for Seminaries, AAAS, Templeton Science for Seminaries grant at Multnomah Seminary through New Wine. And so uh, we'll be coming back to this uh, several days from now for another episode, but I really hope viewers are connecting these dots and listeners because I have found it extremely helpful. Uh, my daughter says, I want to do what Dr. Potter does in my work in healthcare. And as she has argued, thank God, or articulate, thank God for Dr. Potter on numerous occasions, because it has helped us as we have engaged medical doctors and nurses and the like. And they have said, we think you're being realistic. We think that that is a good plan. And we understand where you're coming from. And as I've been drawing from my colleague, Dr. Potter, in how to navigate this with my family in support of our son, who's, who's more than a brain, more than a gallbladder, he is Christopher. Dr. Potter, thank you so much. Thank you viewers and listeners for being with us once again at New Wine Tastings. I'm Paul Lewis Metzger signing off with my colleague, Dr. Potter. Blessings to you all, goodbye. <music>